Welcome to A Thousand Tiny Steps. I'm Barb Higgins, and in this podcast, I'll share personal stories of great joy and tragedy and the steps that brought me there. I have become adept at tracing them backward to find the origin of an event, good or bad, that has affected my life. I have gone from being on top of the world with Division I All-American success to being unable to get out of bed with the grief of losing a child and everything in between. I am painfully honest, which can make people uncomfortable, but discomfort brings growth and oftentimes tragedy brings joy. So tie, buckle, slip on, release up your shoes and join me as we begin our thousand tiny steps. Hey everybody, Barb Higgins here, beginning episode 51 of A Thousand Tiny Steps. I've been watching and rewatching episodes because I recorded them so long ago that I need to always remind myself of what I talked about in the previous episodes. And I often start my episodes with the word so. <laughs> and in listening to other people's podcasts, they do lots of things from episode to episode, which I really like. But I'm sitting here in my usual spot on day two of cool summer weather. So most people are really happy about this. They like the 70s, dry, breezy sort of summer days. But these days feel like fall to me. And this matches perfectly with a blog post that was released the week I'm recording this. Today is August 12th and it's called August and it sort of references how I feel about summer. Probably by the time you listen to this, you'll have already read it if you're following the blog. But it is rejuvenating to not have the oppressive heat sort of holding you down and I haven't gotten sweaty all day because I'm taking today off because tomorrow, August 13th, I am doing a CrossFit competition. I did this competition last year. Little Jack was like four months old. It amazes me that I actually managed to get through it, which I did, and I did fine. I came in last. So my goal this year is to not place last. I remember when I was running for Coach Ludi, and I would say, well, I want to beat so-and-so. And he would say, let's reframe that into a more positive goal. How about I want to win the race as opposed to I want to beat so-and-so? Because now you're making your whole effort against this one person, and that, might, that person may not be a factor in the race at all. So I don't know the 14 women, so 13 others, and then me in my category tomorrow in the competition. So I'm just hoping that I place better than 14th. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. But if I place 14th and I've done my best, I'll be happy with that as well. So that's sort of a current thing that's happening with me. A couple of other things I want to share before I get going. In my podcast episode that came out this week, I talk about a lot of people that I met early on in my return to Concord and people that stayed with me and were important people in my life. Two of them were Erin Moon and Anna Ellison Gladstone, who are now not living by those last names. <laughs> so we'll just call them Aaron and Anna. In the process of releasing that podcast episode, and they listened and all, Anna connected me with two women, Jen and Christine, and they have a podcast called Shenanigans. She being capitalized, so like the she Nanigans. And these are two women who were best friends growing up and have maintained their friendship. But the podcast was begun and centers on the fact that they have both suffered unspeakable tragedy. Of course, when Anna sort of introduced us on my Facebook page, I right away listened. I was driving home from Plum Island to Concord, which is about an hour and a half. And so I listened to the first two episodes in which they share their heart-wrenching stories that sort of got them into doing a podcast. The beauty of it is they're really doing it for the same reasons I am. They're doing this podcast to share their life's ups and downs and invoke humor in it. And that you can be okay even when the unspeakable happens. You can somehow get through it and carry it with you in a way that doesn't ruin the rest of your life. It might damage it considerably, but it doesn't ruin it. So I like it. And they do a little thing where they start each episode with a different kind of wine. And that sort of reminds me of this other podcast called Talk Tales. And this is also two women, one of whom is also named Jen. <laughs> and they start their episodes with a recipe for a cocktail. It's just a lot of fun. I, I really enjoy listening to podcasts and especially podcasts by women and especially ones that just sort of utilize real life stories to share experiences, which can then turn around and help the people who are listening. So I'm looking forward to meeting Christine and Jen in the future. But if you enjoy my podcast, my hunch is that you'll enjoy theirs. I've listened to three episodes as of this recording. And their third one is a hilarious story of some of the shenanigans they got in in high school, small town, Maine. I'll give you a little hint because I have a relatable story. They're with their friends underage drinking on a mountaintop. So I'm just going to say Mount Kearsarge, fall 1980. <laughs> and my friends who are listening will know exactly what I'm talking about. The ones who were there, Jill, Mary, Bridget, Karen, not to do any giveaways. So that is on my mind right now. And the other thing is I just completed my second week coaching at CrossFit Amesbury. I've been doing some coaching in Concord, but 
primarily just subbing in when other people can't coach. And I really want a more regular scheduled coaching experience in my life. And this amazing coach, Addie, went off to the military. Thank you, Addie. And so I've done two Thursdays now and actually jumped in and filled in on a Tuesday. And I've been having a blast. Something that wasn't lost on me is Thursday when I was coaching, there were two coaches working. One was me and one was B, Coach B. So here you have a CrossFit gym, a facility that is phenomenal. And the two coaches are a 21-year-old boy in my mind, but a 21-year-old young man and this 59-year-old old lady. And if that doesn't just encapsulate humanity and all of the ages and genders and fitness levels and abilities that exist between a 21-year-old B and a 59-year-old B, right? So it was an amazing day. We just complement each other really well. And I often talk about how being an adult is great because age ceases to matter so much. And B is like one of my best friends. <laughs> Sorry, B. One more shout out for you. That's sort of where I'm starting off in terms of current life right now. In this episode, in episode 51, so season five here has been talking about the 15 or 16 years or so from my return to Concord until 2005. And I did that chunk of time because that was sort of like my fairy tale time. You know, I had some ups and downs, obviously, all through those years. But for the most part, my life was sort of being put together in a way that I thought would, would last throughout, you know, forever. And it was the fall of 2005 when I get into that season, and I'm not quite sure when I'll start that particular season, that I made some choices and met some people that would turn my life on a trajectory I would liken it to an icy downward spiral. Can't stop because you're on slippery ice. This season has been about those 15 years from my return from Boston to having had Gracie and Molly and really sort of settling into what I call my picket fence life. In doing this podcast and reminiscing about things that have happened to me, it's very easy for me to get really down because I think, oh my gosh, if only I had done this, then this wouldn't have happened. If only I had done that, then that wouldn't have happened. And, you know, the if onlys are the worst. I've talked about this movie before, Homeless, Homeless to Harvard. And there was a scene in the movie where the narrator, so the main character is, was played by Thora Birch, but it's a little girl who grew up in a drug addicted parents household in New York City. And her mother and father die and her sister, and she becomes separated and, and a bit on the outs of each other. But she's narrating the movie. And as the movie ends and she's sort of rehashing her life, she says to the people that are offering her the scholarship that she would give it all back. She would give it all back if she could have her family back. And then she just ruminates on all the if onlys, if only this, if only this, if only this, and how the if onlys can really bring you down. And they can, they bring me down. And there are times that I sit on the porch and I just stare off into space and half an hour can go by and I haven't moved a muscle. And that's a dangerous place to be. I think it's a necessary place sometimes. I am never one to tell someone to stop crying or to toughen up or to don't be sad or stop being so mad or, you know, always, always, if somebody's experiencing something, clearly they need to experience it or it wouldn't be happening. And through processing the experience, sometimes you can make the anger mellow out or dry the tears, but I've never taken kindly to being told how to feel. So in looking at how I was beginning to feel sad, I had had some ideas for this episode and, and I was thinking, no, I don't, I don't think so. What about those wonderful 15 years has lasted, has maintained, has continued? And I came up with some things that are really pretty important, one of which is very family related. And so I'm going to go back to 1993. And that is the year that my youngest sister, Eleanor, was born. So Eleanor and I share a dad, a biological dad. So I have Eleanor. And then I have myself and my brother, Jonathan. And then I have three older siblings, Martha, PJ, and Jeff. So really, when you look at us, the six of us, we could be grandparents' generation, parents' generation child generation. We have enough years between us. We each represent a complete different generation. Martha and PJ and Doug are hardcore baby boomers. I'm a, right on the Gen X line, you know, the very end of the boomer generation into Generation X. And then Eleanor is 93. Is that millennial? I think so. Anyway, none of us are the same. And so that in and of itself is thought pondering sometimes. I look at the fact that Eleanor's grandfather she was born in 1993 and her grandfather was born like in 1850. Like, you know, like when you look at how long ago, or 1890, how long ago those people were born, you know, she has grandparents born in the 1800s. You know, I have great grandparents born in the 1800s. When you look at the birth of our biological father, so you look at the birth of Tom, 1913, and what happened between 1913, the birth of his three children from his marriage, and then myself and my brother, and then Eleanor, all of the things in life that changed with the birth of his children, like completely different planet Earth for him. 
And I oftentimes, you know, just ponder these things. Tom was the most involved as a parent in Eleanor's life. He was a stay-at-home dad. Hannah was the full-time worker. And Eleanor got hours and hours and days and days with Tom in a way that none of us did. And she's lucky, unbelievably lucky. She also got the least amount of time with him. And so, you know, it's sometimes it's hard to, to see what's good and what's sad and what's happy with it. But let me talk about why I'm bringing that up. So I still lived in the tower, that little teeny two-room apartment. I was just married to Eric or maybe not even yet married to Eric when Eleanor was born. But the early 90s, along comes Eleanor. And at that time, I knew my biological reality. You know, I had known who my biological father was for a long time. And I knew who my biological siblings were, but we had never made any connection. You know, it's not my place to interfere with somebody else's family. You know, I didn't ask to be born, nor did my brother Jonathan. But, you know, my older siblings didn't ask to have us be born either. And so, you know, I never, I never really reached out. But along comes Eleanor. And now Martha and I are sharing something. We each have a sister that's equally related to each of us. And all of Tom's family are all equal, equally related to all of us. We all have the same grandparents and the same aunties and the same cousins on our dad's side of the family. There's no difference there. We are equal relatives in that regard. I remember that that was when I finally got to know Martha. And I remember we went out for lunch and we went out for lunch a few times and just took time getting to know one another and you know, our likes and dislikes. We had a lot of similarities. All we daughters are left-handed. We have so many similarities. We all have, I believe all three of us have melanoma scars on our knees. You know, we have all of these little things in common that when you haven't grown up together are quirky and fun to discover. We all love to read. We all love music. You know, there's, there's so many ways that we're similar. We're all blue-eyed blondes. I mean, some of us need help now, but you know, <laughs> this was when I really got to know that side of my family. I got to know PJ at this time, as well as Jeffrey. I had met Jeffrey, however, I had climbed Mount Madison with him when I was seven. That was a long night because we, it was a fall hike. It was my first 4,000 footer, which are a mountain range in New Hampshire. 46 of them were over 4,000 feet. And we got stuck because it was dark, went up too late and came down too late. And Jeffrey had some physical issues from a car accident and couldn't move very quickly. We had the best time. We had so much fun. And I, and I remember it well. And I remember hearing my mother yelling for Tom in the pitch black, dark, fall air and finally getting down. Everything was fine, obviously. But other than that, I, you know, I never spent any time with this, with these family members and it was logical. I was a bit of a secret for a long time. So we got to know one another. And it was at that time that I was very, very honest and clear with Martha about Jonathan, because I didn't know if she knew about him or not. It took them a while. It took Martha and Jonathan both a bit of time to sort of process this. And I remember when I had told Jonathan that I had indeed met Martha, this was right before my wedding. I was living on Albany Street. So it was right around then. Eleanor's birth was the catalyst for me meeting my, the rest of my biological family. And it was interesting. And it's taken years for us all to really get to know one another. Martha and I spent a good deal of time together in the beginning. And then, you know, that peters out. But of course it does because we have our busy lives. Martha's relocated and moved and traveled all around the country you know, with the birth of Molly and Gracie. So now she has these little nieces. Jack Jack is her most recent nephew. She also has grandchildren and Doug's children have grandchildren, have children. So our lives have been very, very busy. We keep in touch. We share things with one another. Do I have the same relationship with those siblings as I do with Jonathan, Johanna, and Rick? Of course not. But, you know, I shared a house with these siblings and my relationship with Eleanor. I met Eleanor for the first time when she was eight months old or maybe just about a year. We see each other as much as possible, but that's also been a relationship of visits. But I think we're closer now that we're all adults and sort of <laughs> navigating the world more freely than when, when Eleanor was little. I remember she came up here and sat in this very room and the newspaper did a story on her and her dad. That series of events all occurred in the 90s, from my living in the tower to living in the apartment on North Main Street to living in my home on Alvin Street, where I first lived when Kenny and I were first married. And then actually we had already bought this house when we were married. That was a busy time, wasn't it now? And those relationships hold, hold true now. I've gone through a lot since then, since growing baby Gordy and losing him and getting married and having Gracie and Molly and going through my job loss and all the ridiculousness around that and then losing Molly and then all the ridiculousness around the bow cross country situation. And then, you know, now having Jack, you know, I, I'm not necessarily an easy person to be around sometimes. Something is always going on. But my relationship with my sisters is phenomenal, all three of them, Eleanor, Martha, and Johanna. I am very, very blessed to have these three women in my lives, whether or not I see them all the time or talk to them all the time. But this is a piece of that 15-year period that stays with me still. 
And in the truest sense of family, in the best sense of family, we all look out for one another and support one another. What I will say that I like about both sides of my family, my mom's relatives and my, you know, and Tom's relatives are that always we can be honest with how we feel and what we think. And then we can put that aside when possible to have positive family interactions. And no one on either side of my family is, you know, believes in murdering people or, you know, I don't know, robbing banks or whatever. So I think we're, we're pretty safe that way, but it's interesting. And I feel lucky that, that I'm able to have these, these relatives. You know, the older you get and the more people you meet, you realize that your life circumstances aren't always so different. I mean, there are lots of people out there who don't have the DNA they thought they did or have parts of their lives that, that are different and don't make sense. In building my business and, and everything, something that's really important to me is honesty. And in the process of setting up values for a company, if I were to have a company or, or, or create a product or become a coach, all those things, to me, honesty is so important. And honesty is a tricky topic. People shy away sometimes, like is too much honesty dangerous? And your honesty hurt people's feelings. Are some things best left unsaid? And I think in my experience and what I've gone through, I think nothing is best left unsaid. I think you can say things carefully. And you can word things in a way that lessens hurt. But if something has happened, then it should be told, I guess. I mean, I have a lot of things that I would prefer were never told. But if I'm demanding honesty, then I'll give honesty. That's the easiest thing. So that's the first thing. That's the first thing I bring up because there's so much in my life that's wonderful because of my biological family on my dad's side. And Eleanor, sweet Eleanor, you are the catalyst for all of that. Your birth really set in motion us all getting to know one another. And I'm appreciative of that. The next thing that I will talk about is Princeton Cross Country Camp. So I have had many, many jobs in my life, lots and lots of different things. And I love that. I have a wealth of experiences. I could go and do a lot of different things if I wanted to. And one of the things I did starting in the summer of 1991 was work at a running camp at Princeton University. Peter Farrell, who's the coach at Princeton for a long, long time, most colleges offered running camps. It was a great way to recruit for your college program made some money for the camp programs that colleges had. And Princeton summer camps are a well-oiled machine. It was typically the first week of August. Actually, in the beginning, it was more like the second week of August. You came home and boom, then cross country started. I remember a couple of years, it was like the end of July, my birthday. I celebrated my birthday at Princeton camp. I always looked at Princeton camp as sort of the beginning of the end of summer because it was August. It was that turning point I talked about in my most recent blog post about, you know, you're going along, it's summer, it's summer, it's summer, boom, it's August, boom, September's here. And then I always packed for Princeton camp, looking forward to the hot, muggy weather of New Jersey, and then just feeling bummed out that summer was really so close to ending and cross country was going to start soon. That was a mixed bag because I love cross country. So my first few years at Princeton camp were wonderful. And I was just one of the counselors. I didn't have a super big leadership role, but I'm a leader when it comes to things I'm good at. It quickly became apparent to Peter that I could have a bigger role at camp. And so little by little every year, I started to be responsible for more and more things. I delivered the opening night welcoming class. And I did a whole goal setting activity using a smart goal and, and how to set a good goal. And they could set a goal for their cross country season. That was usually how I did it. But I would use an example of my own goal and help them through it. And it's a blast. And, and over the years, you know, there was still no social media back then. So it's not like anyone could just email me or text me and say, say that they appreciated. I used to give out envelopes, no lie, with a stamp on them. You shared your goal with one other person at camp, and then you gave each other the envelope so they could mail you whether or not they did it at the end of the season. That's how it sounds so archaic. Oh my gosh. Because now it's just like a, you know, go on the Facebook page. But it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. And over the years, I have gotten many, many now, you know, emails and, and letters in the mail cards saying, thank you so much for this. It helped me. I set this goal and I got it. I wanted you to be the first to know that those were wonderful. So I did a goal setting thing. The other thing we did was I did abs with Babs. And that was <laughs> in the afternoons, they had four stations. They had a pool running station, a weightlifting station, a circuit workstation and abs with abs. And we did some mobility and it was just, just ab work and how important a strong core is. And so that was something that I did. And in the morning I led drills. So drills and strides, and I would make relay races out of the drills and workouts out of them and that sort of thing. It was, it was just so much fun, but you know, I went from just being sort of a counselor my first year of 1991 to the final year, which was 2016. And that was the year of Molly's death. And I went to Princeton only for half of it, like three days. I was a mess. I was a basket case at that time. I really struggled. I got all panicky and just needed to leave early and come home. And Peter was so good to me. You know, Karen and Joe, Lamu, And, you know, there were just so many regulars over the years that were there at that camp. Ashley Higginson, Laura Cadavera, those were runners of Peter's. 
Sarah, what was your last name? She had like a PhD and an MD and 9 million degrees. She was phenomenal. Karen O'Neill was, took her place. It was just such a fun way to do summer. And oh, in the beginning years, it was a co-ed camp. Boys and girls from Concord, I would, so I would load two vans down or I'd get parents to drive and I would bring 10 or 15 campers some years. Other years, it was just a handful, one or two, five or six sometimes. It became, Princeton camp just became the beginning of cross country for us as well. And we had a blast. The kids had a blast. And then over the years, things switched up and now the camps were separate. And the boys week was a completely different week than the girls week, which was kind of a bummer in my mind. I think that, you know, when it was a co-ed camp, we had this dance the last night. I mean, nobody really danced, but we had music and food and it was just a lot of fun. And it went from a five-day camp to a four-day camp. So it's sort of like you pay the same price for a smaller package. (laughs) It was just a lot of fun. When it became a, a completely girls camp, we wanted something else to sort of close out the camp. And I'm like, what about skits? Let's do skits. And so we implemented a skit day. And oh my gosh, some of those skits were hilarious. Really, really fun to watch. And these were things that were done primarily with, with once it just became a girls camp. And it was a blast. I remember a really, really good coach whose name I'm not going to remember right now from Philadelphia who gave an incredibly motivating end of camp speech. And actually over the years, I started to do a, a circle up at the start line where the kids you know, repeat after you. And at the end we'd yell, we race and really loud. It was one, two, three, we race. I see other teams doing it now. I did it with my bow athletes. And when I was with my bow athletes doing it, the Concord athletes were doing it. And so I was happy to see that that lasted. Having that experience, 2000, 2016, all the way back to 1991, there were one or two years I missed. The year that I lost baby Gordy, I missed. So that was 99. I went 91, 92, 93, and then I missed 94 and 95. And then Eric and I separated and I went back in 96. So I went in 96 and 97. I missed, no, I went in 98. I missed 99 because I had baby Gordy. And then I never missed again, 2009 when Jonah was born. And that was it. After that, I I really never missed a camp. All those years, 16, 25 years worth of Princeton camp. I mean, that's a lifetime. That's older than my podcast (laughs) ever. I just love that that was something that started in such a growing positive time in my life and was able to continue through and weather all of all of the storms that happened, you know, from 2005 to Molly's death and beyond, really. That was another thing that when I think of when I first moved back here, and all of the changes I made, I had known Peter Farrell before, just through USA track and field work and conventions and things. So that was a nice connection. That's how he thought to call me and say, look, I'm short staffed, would you come work? So that was wonderful. So that's the number two thing that happened then that still exists. Another sort of thing that that I started, I started in 2001 was Barb's track camp. So Gracie is 21 years old right now. And her first year of life, 2001, was the first year I did Barb's track camp. And I remember vividly looking at other track and field camps. And this was around the time as well. We had already started cross country at Runlet, like looking at other teams that were doing well statewide, cross country and track. And they came from communities that had youth track and field that had middle school track and field and cross country that had programs for kids that introduced them to track and field. Even though track and field is really called athletics and goes all the way back to, you know, Greek mythology, it isn't always the most well-known sport and kids don't think to do it. There aren't big youth track leagues and, you know, kids can play soccer and basketball and softball and baseball and hockey. You know, these things, lacrosse now and field hockey, these are huge, huge endeavors now with year-round opportunities for kids and track and field isn't like that. So I remember we had started cross country at Runlet and then I thought, you know, we need a summer camp. And I went to Parks and Rec and spoke to the director there, David Gill, who still remains the director of Parks and Rec in Concord and said, here's what I'd like to do. Can I run it through Parks and Rec? And he said, yes. Right up until COVID, we ran it through Parks and Rec and and they provided a lot of the infrastructure and the background work. And I just ran the camp. And I have to say, it's probably one of my greatest achievements and I've made zero money from it. So I remember at the time thinking, oh, this will be a great moneymaker. But what I learned right away, at least for how I want to run a camp, is that I want the cost low enough that anyone can afford to come, at least pay part of it. You know, if it's a super prohibitively expensive camp, then only people with money can come. And, you know, not that people with money have easier lives than people without money, but it certainly is a different kind of difficult. And I would never want anyone to miss out on Barb's track camp because of money. And I also overstaff it like crazy. I have way too many staff. But something else I've learned is, The more people you have making sure things are okay, the more okay things are. And so not that I haven't had ups and downs with staff, I have. I will tell you that aside from like the health person, me, the director, the director of kids camp and her assistant, and like five or six campers that are long timers, of the 
180 people that might be on the field that week for a track camp, maybe 10 are old enough to vote. <laughs> and that's it. And the rest are high school students, you know, who have maybe have turned 18, maybe haven't. I find that young children really love their older counterparts, that an adult versus a high school senior, who do you want to hang out with? Oh, 99 times out of 100, they want to hang out with a high school kid. Those are their heroes. They're going to be that someday. They still see an older, an older child as one of them as a child. So that first year I had 25 athletes. And I remember I had Lynn Vinskis and Jen Jaquit. Then, you know, I don't remember the staffers now, too many of the counselors now. My college boyfriend, David, was working at Nike and he brought me up all this like leftover swag, keychains and things to give to the kids. He had all these old Nike spikes, running spikes that were sort of weird sizes or no longer, no longer sold, or he just needed to unload all this stuff. And so every single person at Barb's Track Camp got a pair of spikes that year. <laughs> it was phenomenal. I also would love to point out that that year, a little boy named Philip Gehring was at my camp and he was hilarious, great sense of humor. But he tragically died at the hands of his father. It was a very, very nationally known, he and his sister, Sarah. So I bring up their names because I love when people talk about Molly. And Philip was, was hilarious. Philip and Sarah were really good kids. And they had a very, very tragic end of their short, short lives. Whenever I think of the first year of track camp, I always think of Philip. Stephen Kidder, you were at that camp too. He's all grown up now. His sister, Leslie, was a runner of mine. She came to Princeton camp with me several times. And Leslie died in a car accident when her little baby was just shy of two years old. <laughs> the happiest memories also have tragedy in them sometimes. And, and all of these stories bring up people that I knew or knew of. Track camp has morphed. I would say the smallest year was the first year. Every year it got a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger. The beauty of it is the infrastructure of the camp doesn't need to change based on the number of students there. Sometimes the length of classes will change or the number of staff per group. But I try to have six lessons a day that take all of the morning and a little bit of the afternoon. And then late afternoon is free time and capture the flag and ice cream and treats and excursions and things like this. We really try to keep it, you know, sort of low key. All of the track and field events are covered with the exception of high jump and pole vault. Pole vault would be a liability issue. Little kids, you know, it's not an event that you can really teach at a young, young age. And high jump is just a matter of not having the equipment available anymore since I don't coach there. Other than that, track camp has weathered, has weathered it all. The only year there was not a camp was 2020, and that was the COVID year. So no, there was no camp that year, which is a bummer. But I always say, however old Gracie is, that's the how many camps there have been. If it's 2001, that was camp number one. So we just had nine, you know, 2022, but it was really camp 21. So now it matches her age, right? <laughs> At any rate, that was something that I started in the, in the latter half of those years. I had, I was married by then. Gracie was brand new. I was not, I was not even a year married and Gracie was, you know, born at the end of April and track camp is the end of June. So just two months old. And I just thought I was building a life that I would still be living now. I am still doing track camp now. If Peter hadn't retired, I would still be doing Princeton camp. You know, these are things that, you know, Eleanor and Martha are still my very active sisters. I have a wonderful relationship with Eleanor and she plays a wonderful role in my life. So track camp reminds me in all of the, especially the professional struggles that I've had, that I am who I say I am. You know, this year I had a hundred students come to my camp. A hundred families wouldn't send their kids to camp if there was really anything wrong with Barb Higgins. And maybe I'm sounding defensive here, rehashing a lot of what's happened to me. When you surround yourself with people that you think have your back and, and ultimately are in your lives for very different reasons, horrible things get said about you sometimes. You know, and, and again, I will always own what's mine and I will never, ever deny what I've done. But, you know, they're my stories to tell and others to question, I guess. I don't know. But I look at track camp as just sort of the greatest thing. Once COVID was done and Hearts and Rec reestablished camps, they didn't want to do track camp anymore. And my hunch is that it doesn't have anything really to do with COVID. Maybe it has other things around it. I don't know, nor do I care. So I do it myself now and I actually run it through the Molly B Foundation and I make it a fundraiser for her foundation. I don't make a lot of money off this camp. I think the most I've ever made after all expenses and everything is about $2,000, which isn't bad for five days of work. Although for me, it's a lot more than five days of work. But typically what I did with that money was put it back into things for the camp. And I do that now. I put it into replacing turbo jabs and all the things that we buy for camp <laughs> before camp starts. And the salaries, the salaries eat almost all of it up. But, you know, these young people give a week of their summer. They deserve to have a stipend. It's not great money, but it's not bad. So I love it. I need to make a blanket of all my track camp t-shirts from 2001 to now. I think it would be actually a pretty wonderful blanket. So those are three things. I'm sitting here in 2022 and I can talk of 
my family. I can talk of my experiences as a running counselor at Princeton camp. And I can talk about Barb's track camp as things that are still relevant and current and pertinent in my life. It's important, I think, you know, I don't, I don't like to be one of these podcasters with these big messages in my, in my episodes. I'm really just trying to share stories <laughs> and things that I love about my life and things that I hate about my life and how I'm managing to live while I carry around things I don't like. I find that I'm trying very hard now to look back at a dark time and see what in that time was light. And track camp is one that, that comes to mind. I actually was sitting here the other day yesterday with Amy Zumez, Zumi Zoom. She's the javelin coach extraordinaire. And she came to camp as a camper and then she worked at it in her high school years. And then she worked at it as an adult many, many times. And she came this year in her, you know, in, on her crutches and her cast and helped out over at Javelin. She was wonderful. And we were talking about her early years as a counselor there and how it was a much smaller group. I think the entire staff was probably 12 people. And they would meet on Friday morning at a restaurant that was called The Corner View. Now it's called Tucker's. And they would have staff breakfast and they'd, I used to have them make each make an award for each of their campers. Like, and I printed them out and they wrote their names on them. I would really like to bring that back. That would be a pretty cumbersome task based on how big the camp has gotten and how fluid sometimes staffers can be. But that was back when every single staff member was on my track team because I coached right there at Concord High. And so it was easy to get them to do it. That was a lot of fun in the ways that the staff got together. I love in my Facebook memories when those pictures come up. It's really tremendous because there they all are, these sweet little trackies and all. Those are the things that sort of stay with me. The other thing I'd like to talk about during that time is how I took a really formerly great track and field and cross country program at Concord High School. And it had been really, it had really fallen apart. 1988, the track and field team were state champs. 1986, cross country were state champs. And when I took over in the fall of 1990, cross country team had like four girls on it. It wasn't even a full team. They didn't even score. And indoor track was all but invisible. Indoor track had never been huge in Concord. It really had never been a big piece of the track and field fabric. And then outdoor track was also a bit of a mess falling apart, coach after coach. It's not, it's not an easy sport to coach. You need a lot of help and support. And it isn't a money generating sports. School districts aren't willing to pay the coaches a lot of money. A football coach makes a lot more for the same number of weeks as a track and field coach does. That is what it is, I guess. I started coaching cross country and then I ended up doing indoor and then outdoor. I did three seasons my first year in the district. The following few years, I just did cross country and indoor and I did not do outdoor. And then I gave up the indoor and just did cross country and outdoor. And then eventually I did all three again. And I did all three right up until I left the district. And I have to say, it was exhausting sometimes, but invigorating. And I, I remember I had three or four years under my belt and I still had small teams. They were getting bigger. I went from, you know, seven girls in cross country to 12, to 15, to 17, to 20. I was getting there. You know, they were, it was slowly building. It took me from 1990 to 1995 to make it, to really place in class L's and make it to the meet of champions and then to New England's. I talked about that episode when I mentioned Anna and Erin and how Anna was so bummed out about having to run. We sort of figured out that basketball preseason had started. So now what do you do? She's the star of the basketball team and she has to run a cross country race. But those years took me a long time to really establish it. And that was a time when I then stopped doing indoor track and was doing cross country and outdoor track. And I remember from 95 through now 2000, so those five years, cross country started to suddenly become really, really good. And we had a change in athletic directors shortly thereafter. Bill Whitmore came along in, the, I think, the mid-90s, early to mid-90s. But I remember very much him calling and saying, please, would you please consider doing indoor track? And I hadn't done it for a bit. I was pregnant with Gracie and I thought, oh, I don't know. Okay, fine, I'll do it. I was, remember I was living on Alban Street. And I remember the cross-country setup meeting. I had my old gray Coach Babs sweatshirt on that my first cross-country team gave me. And 60 girls signed up, 6-0. And I remember thinking, what, what, what? And suddenly indoor track was huge. And I had between 60 and 80 girls on indoor track from then on. And it was awesome. I mean, it was really good. They had these JV meets and, and Concord was like the entire JV meet. And then outdoor track was the same. My biggest outdoor track team was 109, 109 athletes. And I remember a then athletic director, Bill Harbrick, coming down and walking around and pulling me aside later on and saying, I've never seen 100 girls so well organized and nobody's doing anything wrong. Well, it was me and one assistant because that's what I got, me and one assistant. And then the boys had a boys coach and one assistant. And we shared some events, but for the most part, we each coached our own people. And then we would oversee, like, I remember Coach Daly would oversee pole vault. So I would oversee high jump. You know, like we shared things as best as we could. 
what I would do is put the kids together in groups and assign a group leader. So I would take the best javelin thrower and say, look, your job is to make sure javelin is safe and go do this, this, and this. I'll never forget it. He just said, I've never seen anything like it. You know, And I was very, very good at organizing people. I am not good at organizing paper. And I'm looking around my office, if you're watching, and I talk about it and bemoan it all the time and apparently do nothing to change it. It's very difficult for me. I have no trouble organizing people. One of the compliments I got in my very first day coaching at CrossFit Amesbury was from one of the owners. The morning CrossFit class was small and there was a current coach in that one and he said I did fine. And then the, the CFA 45 class, the 45 minute sort of boot camp style CrossFit class had 12 people. And so I split everyone up into groups of two or three. There were five things to go through. So I just assigned people and you just follow along. You went to the next thing and you didn't have to see the whiteboard because you just went to the next thing. And so when it was all said and done and the class was over, the owner was like, that was incredibly, I never had to look at the whiteboard. I'm, I've never not had to look at the board. What made you think to do that? And I just smiled. I said, girls track and middle school phys ed. <laughs> when you have to organize big, large groups of people, you get good at it. And, and I'm good at that. So whatever my future holds for me, I think I need to organize large groups of people. <laughs> Any takers? I don't even know what that means. What's my niche? My niche is large groups of people. <laughs> I can look back on those, those 16 years of coaching not knowing I only had five left from 2005 on and know that, that I did a really good job, that it wasn't just the championships. It was all those kids that would never have done track or cross country. The number one time that young women are impregnated by their boyfriends and drugs are taken by boys and girls both or, or students in general is three to six. School gets out, parents get home and there's that window of time where, oh, the kids are old enough to be alone now. Well, really babies are safer by themselves tuck a bottle next to them, put them in a bassinet. They can't go anywhere. I don't really do that. But my point is, you know, if a baby is in a safe structured place that they can't get out and hurt themselves, they're far less likely to make a stupid decision than a 13 year old boy or girl or whomever, a 13 year old young person alone with no parental supervision. And so car accidents and accidents and unwanted pregnancies or unplanned pregnancies and drug use shoplifting, all of these things that can get young people in trouble happen between three and six. And so I oftentimes, you know, look back on those years as feeling really good about myself. Mr. Ludi had amazing teams. His boys cross country teams were huge at a time when nobody really knew what cross country was. And I can remember feeling so fulfilled inside because I felt like I was, you know, fulfilling coaches' dreams for me as well. It really mattered to me what he thought of me always all through that time. And I think when I think of all that I've lost and I look at, you know, I'd be entering like my 30th year and, and, you know, I really wish I was still doing some of these things. I look at my life and all the things I'm doing because I'm not coaching at Concord High School and I, and I have tremendous gratitude and I know amazing people, but I have that tinge of sadness when I think back to how happy I was and how fulfilling life seemed for me at that time. But I look at, I look at those years and I look at the number of, of young women and older women you know, the seniors, the year I started are 50 now, turning 50. Oh, that's crazy. The feedback I still get. And so, and I feel that way, you know, I have a list of people that I still remember from my high school and college years that changed my life exponentially because of how good they were to me. So those are things that all sort of started when I came back, started in those 15 years of redefining myself, you know, teaching at Walker and the birth of my baby sister and meeting the rest of my family and and starting a track camp and working at this well-established Ivy League cross-country camp and, and building up a track and field and cross-country program at Concord High that is really unparalleled since, really unmatched. And I have to feel like, okay, Barbara, it's okay. Everything will be okay. I don't want to sound like I'm full of myself because I'm really not. In between all these words <laughs> is that little voice in my head reminding me of all of my screw-ups. And I think that's probably true for all of us. Those are some things that I, that I came upon in those early years that I still feel really good about that I'm proud of. You know, I'm, I'm sitting here recording this the day before I enter into a CrossFit competition at my other CrossFit home, CrossFit Amiskeg. I'm really lucky. Both my CrossFit gyms have CFA, so I'm wearing one now. That's helpful. So I wanna thank you all for listening as always. It's mid-August as I'm recording this. By the time you hear it, it'll be almost the end of August. I hope that you're enjoying your remaining days of summer wherever you live. I hope that you'll read some of my blogs and sign up for, the, sign up for my email. I've said it before and I'll say it again. It's not a long, long email that, that goes into detail about what the podcast episode is or was. I, I can't stand those emails. That's just me personally. No offense to those of you that write them that way. What I like about the email is that it's written in real time. Here's how I am right now. I'm not writing it two weeks ahead. The podcast, when I, like, I don't always record in real time because, you know, I have an editor that does a tremendous job editing these, 
these shows and I want to honor his time schedule and his work life as well. And so sometimes I'm a couple of weeks ahead. I will end season five with episode 52. Episode 53 falls on the first Tuesday in September. Last year was September 7th. This year will be September 6th. I will do a one-year anniversary episode and I'll think of something. I'll think of some fun, crazy thing to talk about. Then season six will start as year two begins to start. So that's what you have to look forward to. The season ending episode, just to give you a little heads up, will really wrap in how I met Kenny and the reasons I went on that field trip to Washington, D.C. to begin with. And I'll talk in depth about Chris Rath and my experience in helping her through an a episode at that time. I'm going to tell it in detail. It will be, I'll tell you, it'll be a bit uncomfortable because that piece of information speaks to a much bigger piece of reality in the Concord School District. And Chris Rath and her actions here become relevant when I finally get into the chaos years and the years that my life took that tragic, awkward turn. It brought me to where I am today. So listen, be good to yourself. Do something kind. Take good care of yourself. Do something nice for someone else, even if it's little. And as always, have a good day, everybody. Hey, thanks for listening and for supporting A Thousand Times Steps. I hope you enjoyed the episode and will continue to listen. Feel free to leave a review and share my stories with your friends. Also, please reach out if you have stories to share. I love hearing from and connecting with my listeners. If you would like to know what I'll be talking about down the road, you can find me on Instagram at barb underscore 444, on Facebook as Barb Higgins, and at my website, www.1000tinysteps.com.